Hello, I am Kyle Clarich, uh, coming to you from Rochester, Minnesota, Department of Cardiology, and we are hosting a series called Interview with the Expert. And today we are going to be talking about how to choose the right aortic valve with our expert, Dr. Rick Nishimura, who many of you will know has recently been the chair of the Valvular Heart Disease Guidelines. And so I think he's quite qualified to talk about cardiac valves. So especially in the aortic valve, you know, we have all these different things we can do now. You've got someone with aortic stenosis or even aortic regurgitation. How do you know which valve to choose? Mechanical, tabby, you know, what are we going to do? How yeah, do we simplify question. it? Okay, great question. And, and I, I'll tell you that the guideline, you know, we had guidelines in like 2012, 2014, 2017, 2020. Every time we significantly changed the indication for the type of valve because the trials were coming out, the randomized trials were coming out you know, you know, in rapid succession, giving us new information and new information. But I think now in the 2020 guidelines, we finally have it down as to the type of valve we would recommend, understanding that in the end, it's a shared decision-making process with the patient. And it's gonna be up to the patient with their own needs and preferences to pick the type of valve that they want. But at least from the data, we can give them an idea on what we feel might be the best for them in the long run. So should I just kind of go ahead, Kyle, and run through how we, how we yeah, look at this? I think, you know, you're, imagine yourself sitting with one of your typical patients that needs an aortic valve replacement and maybe walk us through how you do that shared decision-making and which valves might be beneficial to which groups of patients. Okay, so we'll, we'll give an overview first and then we can kind of go to the nuances and what you're telling the patient in terms of uh, pros and cons of each approach. But let's say the patient does have the diagnosis of aortic stenosis and you've already made the decision that they would benefit from a valve replacement either to um, improve mortality, to improve symptoms, or now we're, we're going earlier and earlier to prevent the adverse consequences of this pressure overload on the left ventricle. And we used to make a big thing about, well, are they uh, low risk, are they intermediate risk, are they high risk, so on and so forth, but we can simplify that now because it turns out that the randomized trials with TAVI versus surgical AVR show that all for, for all the spectrum of risk, um, TAVI is probably uh, equivalent in select groups of patients. And can you so just, the first thing we should, go ahead. I'm just gonna make sure that all, everyone listening knows what TAVI stands for. Yeah, so TAVI is transcatheter aortic valve implantation, we were saying that instead of replacement now, because it's actually taking a, uh, a valve that's wrapped around a catheter, putting the catheter across the valve, blowing up a balloon within the, the valve, and the, the, the valve then expands and goes, takes the place of the native stenotic valve. You pull the catheter out and you have a new valve um, opening and closing and uh, uh, working just fine. So here we have a patient with aortic stenosis. And, and, and I think the first thing we do is we take those patients who are at maybe high risk of surgery or even prohibitive risk, because those patients that if we decide they should have a valve would probably be best served with TAVI. Because in these patients, TAVI can be done with a lot lower risk um, than surgical aortic valve replacement. Now, one thing we have to remember here is, as cardiologists, we tend to want to help everybody no matter what. But um, there are some patients that have what we call a prohibitive risk. And it, let, let's say their lifespan is less than one year or um, the, the, their quality of life is so poor, even if you replace the valve, it's going to remain poor. Those are the patients that we would then say, well, let's kind of step back and talk about palliative care rather than any intervention. So that's on this end of the spectrum. So we've got this, these patients at high risk for surgery. Probably if they're going to have anything done, the TAVI would be the thing to do. Now, 
these other groups of patients would be at an acceptable risk for surgery. And there's lots of ways that we look at risk, but one is to put in a calculator and say, we feel that based on all these variables that the risk of an operation is less than 8%. We have to look at the frailty of the person. We have to look at comorbidities, you know, whether they're you know, morbidly obese, have uncontrolled diabetes, have end-stage cancer, so on and so forth. But the other acceptable risk, we then would look at how old they are. Because it turns out that now, now just for people to understand, when we talk about TAVI, we're talking about a tissue prosthesis. When we talk about surgery, it can either be a tissue prosthesis or a mechanical prosthesis. And Kyle, we can kind of expound later about the pros and cons of each one. But it turns out that in people who are, let's say, less than 50 years old, a mechanical prosthesis actually has a survival benefit. Now, a mechanical prosthesis is made out of metal, so you need long-term anticoagulation, and we still say that you need warfarin for the anticoagulation. And there is some small risk of bleeding, but the risk is going lower and lower and lower as the valves are getting better and better. But the thing about the mechanical prosthesis is they never wear out. So if you got a 45-year-old and we say, let's put in the mechanical prosthesis, chances are that might be the last operation that they ever need. And because of that, we say in the younger patients, less than 50, unless they have a contraindication to anticoagulation, a mechanical prosthesis would be the thing to do. Now, on the other hand, you might have a group of people who are, let's say, greater than 75 years old. And those greater than 75 years old are definitely going to benefit from a tissue prosthesis versus a mechanical prosthesis because the tissue prosthesis should last 10, 15, 20 years. And if they're over 75, their risk of open surgery is higher. So those patients, we usually say a TAVI might be very, very appropriate in those patients. Now, it also then leaves you with this group between about 50 and 70 years old. And I've never given any absolute cutoffs here because you all know that a 74-year-old can look like a 50-year-old, a 50-year-old can look like a 75-year-old, depending on the individual and it, you know how well they've taken care of themselves. So we're just giving some approximate age groups here. Now, for 50 to 70 years old, this is where the shared decision-making process comes in, because then you talk to them about the risks and benefits of a mechanical valve placed surgically, versus a tissue valve. And remember the mechanical valve, you need the warfarin, but they last forever. You're not looking at another operation. A tissue prosthesis, on the other hand, you only need warfarin probably for the first three months. You don't need warfarin afterwards, but they're going to wear out. And at 10 to 15 years, you're looking at another operation. So these are the patients that you kind of talk about pros and cons of each approach and um, patients themselves will tell you what they want. Now, a caveat to this, the mechanical versus tissue, once you have a tissue, you then say, am I gonna have a TAVI or a surgical aortic valve replacement? And there's a lot of nuances that come into place there, but a TAVI, actually should only be in patients older 65 years old because the studies haven't been done with the younger patients less than 65 years old. And we don't know what the long-term outcome is. So if you're greater than 65 and you decided you want a tissue prosthesis, I think a TAVI would be a very appropriate thing. But less than 65 and over 50, then we're looking at a surgical aortic valve replacement versus a mechanical aortic valve replacement. And you need to talk to them about the 
risks and benefits of each one. So that's kind of, uh, it's taken a lot of trials, taken a lot of discussion we had about who takes, gets what type of eval, but this kind of puts it into place here um, into an algorithm remembering it's going to be the patient and their family that's gonna make the final decision. Well, that's a really nice summary, thank you. I wonder if you could just expand upon why the over 65 would do better with a tissue tabby versus uh, under 65 doing better with a tissue surgical? Well, we, we do not recommend the TAVI for people less than 65 years old because of the fact that it hasn't been studied in those patients. All the studies have been done in patients over 65 years old. Um, and and we, we need to await the studies of the younger people to see how long the TAVIs last. We don't know how long they're gonna last. We don't know if they're gonna last eight years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years or whatever. And so we need the trials to come out before we apply these um, kind of guidelines to our own patients. And since the trials have been in patients over 65 years old, we say that less than 65, we should not do a caveat. Well, that's a great summary. So I think we, we've really uh, done a nice job of sorting out the general relative risk for each of these different groups, but keeping in mind that the younger patient will have, you know, the younger being less than 50, which is getting younger and younger every day in my mind, uh, <laughs> only needs a mechanical uh, valve and that'll be their last operation. And the greater than 75 uh, will benefit from a tissue valve in this day and age will be a tabby because they're going to just by virtue of their age have a higher risk. And the 50 to 70 uh, shared decision-making with uh, surgical, probably uh, or mechanical or tissue if they're less than 65, but surgical or TAVI if they're greater than 65. And again, that shared decision-making becomes really important. And the reason we're not uh, recommending TAVI for the younger patient population less than 65 is they just haven't been studied. And we need to wait for those results so we can recommend it. Yeah, you, 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 you summarized it very nicely. I, I just want to say some other things is that there's some anatomic uh, abnormalities that might prevent you from doing the TAVI. Let's say you've got a 75-year-old and that 75-year-old, there's extensive calcification in the outflow track, which means that the TAVI might not be beneficial. Let's say there's a lot of hypertrophy in which uh, of the outflow track in which a TAVI might not be beneficial. If a person might need something else like uh, coronary bypass grafting for severe coronary disease, you'd probably do surgery because you could do the, the uh, bypass at the same time as the aortic valve. If there's other valves that need to be done, you'd probably do surgery rather than TAVI because you could do two or three valves at once. So there's some anatomic reasons that even at the older age, you might want to do surgical versus TAVI, but that's all kind of an individual patient characteristics being taken into consideration. In, 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 in centers of excellence, which you brought out in the guidelines, I think in valvular heart disease centers of excellence, what kind of a mortality and morbidity are we looking at for people in these various age groups that are undergoing surgical interventions? Well, um, it's really changed through the years, which is why we're lowering the threshold for aortic valve replacement. But um, in an otherwise healthy person who has an isolated aortic valve replacement, the risk should be less than 1%. Back yeah. in the old days, it was 5 to 8 to 10%, in which case we would shy away from that. But boy, if you can do an operation and, and really improve things with a risk of less, less than 1%, that's why our thresholds for operating are getting lower and lower and lower. Uh, yeah, and I think that's really important when you uh, talk to patients because oftentimes patients will go to the closest location to get a surgery done. And I think it's really important when patients are thinking about this that they're really querying the surgeons as to how many uh, valve replacements they do and also do they have the the entire gamut available to them at that institution so that they're not biased in terms of their decision making. And the last but not least, you know, what is their, their rates of success? And I think that's really important um, in addition to the numbers. So uh, I think that really summarized things well for this interview with the experts. Rick, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and especially all the energy you and your committee uh, put into updating the newest guidelines in 2020.
Okay, thanks very much, Kyle. Thanks, everyone. Thank